let's start with internal loads. These are pretty straightforward, so we can go through them pretty quickly. And here I am in the IDF editor, and I'm going to go right down to people. You can see that people, lights, equipment are all located in the same general area here. So let's start with people. And um, I'm going to fill this in for Worcester Hall Room 214. Um, the name of the object is Zone 1 People. The name of the zone is Zone 1. The uh, schedule of people coming and going is this school OXG, or Occupancy Schedule. That's what it stands for. Uh, number of people calculation method. It says people, and if I click on this drop down, you'll see that there's three options. I can either select people, people per area, or area per person. And um, these three number of people, people per zone area, zone floor, floor area per person, uh, will depend on what you select here. So right now I've got 25 people because, um, well, in our case, we've got 17 people. Um, I can also do it, instead of 17 people, I could do it on a person per square meter basis. So I could say that there is 0.1 people per square meter, for instance, but then I would want to change this to people per area. Um, and in this case, Energy Plus will ignore this 17 and just look at this 0.1 number. If I want to do it by zone floor area per person, I could say that there is 10 square meters per person, and then change this similarly to area per person. And now it will ignore both of these and just look at this. So it's vitally important that you um, pay attention when you're filling out any of these the, uh, calculation methods. And you'll see when you go to lights, it has a similar um, way of doing things. With a calculation method, you can do just in watts, watts per meter squared, or watts per person. Same with electric equipment, hot water, etc. So going back to people here, I'm going to keep going with my just 17 people. And then um, the rest of these, you can, you can pretty much ignore the um, values here. This is the amount of heat, radiant heat that they're giving off, which is 30% of their heat is radiant. Um, the sensible heat is set to calculate, auto-calculate. The activity level schedule is the, this schedule, refers to the schedule activity sk or activity schedule. Um, and actually, this is a good time to, um, to go over schedule. So, you, so I skipped over this one before. This is the number of people schedule, and this is the activity schedule. And all the schedules are located up here in this schedule compact. Uh, so let's go look at those two schedules, the activity schedule and the occupancy schedule. Here's the activity schedule right here. And you can see that there's a specific way that these are written. And if you speak in weird English, you can, you can make the logic work. So the activity schedule is named activity schedule. And the schedule type limits, you can see over here, is any number. So that number, it, in this case, it doesn't matter. It's just any number that um, is going to be returned. And you'll see what I mean by that in a second. And it's going to look for any number through December 31st. So in your head, you should say from January 1st through December 31st for all days until 24 o'clock is midnight. So in your head, you should say from 1 a.m. until midnight and 120 is the number it's going to look for so that number is this any number so what this essentially does as a schedule is it says that um, people are going to have 120 watts of activity level that's how much heat they're going to give off at all times now if you wanted to be creative about this you could probably reprogram this to account for lunch that people would have a higher metabolism uh, at lunch as they're digesting, maybe giving off more heat, or maybe after, if you're at a school, after recess, the kids come back in and they're um, warmer after playing, or maybe you're sitting through this lecture right now and you're falling asleep and everybody is down to like 60 watts. And so um, you could 
theoretically go through and reprogram these so that you have a customized activity schedule. So that's just one example. It's a very basic one. Um, in our case, let's not change this. Let's just keep this at 120, which is a good estimate of an average activity level um, for a sedentary, um, sedentary person, say, sitting at a desk. Now, we are, you'll, you'll notice as you page through these, I shouldn't have skipped ahead like that. Let me go back to the beginning. There's an always on schedule, which is, in this case, a fraction, meaning one, um, means that something is always on. So if I assign that to my activity schedule, it would just say that it's uh, always one. If I uh, assigned always off, it would always be zero. And what I mean by assign is going here and instead of uh, assigning this activity schedule, I could assign it always on or always off. Um, and so it would effectively give, if it was always off, it would give no heat. It would be zero all the time. Um, so let's go back up to the schedule. We've got always on, always off. I've got a tree schedule in there, which is a 60% um, transparent. A night ventilation schedule will get later in the semester. And then you see there's a set of schedules for each um, program type. So off is uh, abbreviation for office. So we have an office light schedule, an office equipment schedule, an office domestic hot water schedule, an office occupancy schedule, an office cooling set point schedule, that's for your thermostat, an office heating set point schedule, that's for your thermostat. Um, and then, so those are all the office schedules. And then we move into residential. So for the um, house or apartment, uh, these are the schedules you use. This is residential lights, residential equipment, residential domestic hot water, residential cooling, heating, and occupancy schedule. And now here we're getting to where this building that I'm modeling is, Worcester 214, school. So we have a school equi equipment schedule, school domestic hot water, school light schedule, school occupancy schedule, and then I'll just fast forward here. We have a school cooling, heating. And then after this, we have hotels. And that's it. So let's go back to the, the school occupancy schedule. And let me walk you through this one so you can get the hang of it, what this means. Um, the school occupancy schedule is a fraction. So what it's saying is that whatever number, say we have 17 students, then it's going to multiply the 17 students times whatever number is, is in here. So uh, until 8 a.m., um, it's going to look for the number and multiply by zero. So we're going to have no one in the room until 8 a.m., from midnight to 8 a.m. From 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., it's going to say 70% of the people are in the room. So 70% of 17 people. And from uh, 4 p.m. until 9 p.m., 15% are in, and then after 9 p.m., uh, no one is in. And that happens on um, from January 1st until June 30th for weekdays and the summer design day. Don't worry about the design days. They're left over from another run. But this is for weekdays. For all other days, which you see right here, for all other days, meaning... Uh, weekends and holidays um, until midnight, zero. So this says that no one is in the school at all on Saturday or Sunday. I know that you guys are there working all the time. Now, there's effectively a summer break between June 30th and September 1st uh, because what this is saying is from June 30th to September 1st, no one is there from midnight until 8 a.m. From 8 to 9, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., 15% of the people are there. And then from 9 to midnight, no one is there. So compare this 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. period in the summertime to the 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. period where we have 70% of the students and 15% of the students doing the rest of the time. I hope that makes sense. So that's for weekdays in the summer, 
And then we have all other days in the summer, no one is there on the weekends or holidays. And then finally, uh, for the fall semester, this now says through December 31st. So you, you have to go back up here and say from September 1st through December 31st, we return to this schedule, which is the one from before, with 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 70%, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., 15%, and no one's there on other days. So I hope that this helps you to understand how the schedules are written. And if you want to customize the schedule, feel free. It is kind of a pain to customize these, to go through and do all this. Uh, so um, consider it. Uh, don't take it lightly if this is something you want to undertake to change the schedules. Um, we'll cover some of these other schedules as we go through, but that's an overview of schedules and how they apply to people. Now that you've done people, the lights should be very similar, uh, simple, because it's very similar. We have the name of the lights, the zone that they're applied to, the schedule name, which we just saw is the school light schedule, and now we're doing this as watts per area. We could count up all the individual lights and assign a wattage to each and then give a total wattage. And then we'd want to change this to lighting level and then input it here, say uh, 500 watts. Uh, but the way that I calculated the, this was based on a watts per square meter basis. Whoops. So watts per area. This is also called the lighting power density. And we talked about this in class. So 20 watts per square meter. You could also do it watts per person. And what's interesting about this is it means that depending on that occupancy schedule, the wattage, the, the lights would change. So if, for instance, you had occupancy sensors on your lights, this would be a really nice way of programming it so that the lights would go on when people are there, but they'd go off when they're not there. In this case, the, the lights are, um, the schedule is relative to the, um, to this uh, school light. So, so all of the um, wattage is going to be multiplied by the fraction that the school light schedule says. Um, so if we go back up to schedule compact and go to the school light schedule here, then you can see from midnight until 7 a.m. we've got 0.17 percent or sorry 17 percent of the lights are on and then from 7 to 9 90 percent of the lights are on so let's go back to lights I think that's that's pretty much it I don't think there's anything else to cover here it's pretty straightforward um, and electrical equipment is a similar process once again. We've got equipment as object one and we've got process as object two. Make sure you keep these distinct uh, so that you can report them uh, separately. And, um, and what I'd like you to do is to estimate your wattage based on your, um, based on your initial uh, documentation. Uh, but be very, very careful with your estimates of the wattage. It's very common for people to overestimate uh, the wattage. And keep in mind that this is going to be multiplied by the schedule, so the school equipment schedule. So uh, be very, uh, how can we say, err on the lower side of uh, inputting your uh, equipment power density or, equi or total equipment power. I don't care how you do it. If you do it by the total amount or the watts per meter squared, or watts per person for that matter. Although watts per person probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, well, it might make sense depending on your building and what's what's using the equipment. Um, for instance, I can think of a case where uh, someone's computer is only on if they're there, in which case, yeah, it probably makes sense to tie it to the occupancy. But, um, I'll leave this up to you to, to figure out the best way of going about it. Um, for the process loads, um, now these can be really tricky, particularly related to schedules, because oftentimes process loads are very high and not operated for very long. And so right now I've got this set to be this, the school equipment schedule, 
but you might want to create your own process load schedule uh, to better and more accurately reflect when your process loads are on and how long they're on. Alternatively, you could average out the wattage so that you're basically lowering the wattage and keeping this equipment schedule. Either way is fine. Um, one thing to consider here as well, and this is a little bit different for, for process loads, is this category called fraction lost. And what this means is what percentage of the heat is lost to the outdoors or lost outside of the zone more specifically. So an example of this would be like a dryer, a laundry machine dryer, where uh, it's vented to the outside and roughly 70%, maybe even more, 90% of your dryer heat is actually going outside. It's not being transferred to the thermal zone. Um, some other examples might be a server room that is in the basement or remote off-site that is uh, not warming up the zone or a, um, say, an exterior load like a conveyor belt that might, be, um, that might be somewhere else. If it's something that's completely outside the zone, uh, you can set this to one, and that will have the entire um, load be lost to the zone. It'll still keep track of how much electricity it's using um, and report that number. But, uh, but you won't be also needing to cool that number down.